For Kruma Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimuli. Joining me today is Professor Sean Davison, here to discuss his book, The Price of Mercy, A Fight for the Right to Die with Dignity. So Professor Davison, by now you are well known for your activism in favor of those who wish to have the right to die with dignity. Uh, in 2010, you assisted your own mother to end her life in New Zealand and you were arrested for what you did. Your book details the hunger strike that she embarked upon, but eventually you had to step in to help her end her life. Is this where your activism began? Yes. Um, when I spent a few months with my mother before she died, I'd never thought about euthanasia. I'd never thought about the suffering that comes with dying. And only when it happens to you do you become aware of it. And after my own case hit the media with my arrest and my trial in New Zealand, I was inundated with people sharing similar stories. And I realized I wasn't unique at all in my story. And I became aware of the need to change the law. And yeah, I guess that was the crossroad in my life that led to me fighting to become a, a law changer, a campaigner for a law change. Uh, in South Africa, uh, voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide are illegal. So why do you believe that this law should be changed? And can you explain what sort of situations you see as meeting the criteria for assisted dying? I feel there is overwhelming support for a law change in the country. Um, the, the law will be very clearly defined. It will be safeguards. It's really giving an individual the option of an assisted death if they need it. It's only an option. Nobody will be forced into it. And initially, we looked only at terminally ill people with a short prognosis, maybe going to live for another six months or a year. And eventually, we decided we should follow other countries with not only terminally ill, but people suffering unbearably. And that would include people such as Dr. Anik Berger, who I helped to die, who was a quadriplegic. Um, his suffering could be considered unbearable, and it would be his option to have an assisted death if he wanted it. But there would be very clear safety guidelines in place to make sure the law wouldn't be abused. Now, you were arrested again in 2018 in South Africa and charged with three murders for helping three people in their lives. Now, your plea deal required that you admit to murder and legally in South Africa, you are classified as a convicted murderer. But after you completed your three-year house arrest, you said publicly that you are not a murderer um, and that you hadn't committed a crime. How do you reconcile your legal conviction and your ethical convictions? When I pleaded guilty to murder in the plea bargain, it was based only on the law. The law defined what I'd done to help those three men to end their own lives was classified as murder. If I did not admit to that, I would almost certainly have gone to jail as a murderer. The, the minimum sentence is, uh, is mandatory, life sentence for premeditated murder. And all three of those cases were classified as premeditated because they were planned. So it was either go to jail or plead guilty to a technicality of the law that should be changed. Okay, so when I came out, I think I shocked a few people in the legal world, but I immediately denied what I admitted to in the plea bargain. Then I was denying common sense. I did not commit murder. And that's what I said at the high court steps when I stepped out. The three men I helped to die were suffering unbearably. And if they could have ended their own lives, they would have. I was only the hands that they didn't have. It was not murder, it was suicide. So yeah, I, I reconcile what you said very easily. I admitted to murder, I denied murder. I, I think it's quite clear what I did. Now, in South Africa, you received a suspended prison sentence of eight years and you had served three years of house arrest. Now, some may say this is lenient for the charges you face. Do you think uh, you so-called got off lightly? Um, and do you think it signals a change in how the South African judiciary views the laws governing euthanasia? Certainly, it was a very lenient sentence compared to three life terms in jail. Um, and I did pinch myself every morning that I wasn't in jail as I woke up on house arrest. Uh, but it was a punishment. It was meant to be a punishment. I couldn't do anything more than travel to work um, during working hours. And there were random checks on the house 
by the police during the day, during the night, to make sure I hadn't left. And it's particularly tough on the kids. I couldn't do anything with them. We used to walk to the shop to get an ice cream or go to the park. And so for three years, it was a, a punishment. But yeah, definitely much better than prison. No, I, I don't think my sentence at all reflects the government going soft on euthanasia, not for one moment. Um, there are a lot of questions around why it took them five years to arrest me after Dr. Amit Berger was helped to die. They had the evidence, they had my admission to it, they had a complaint from the public, but they waited five years. And the feeling is that the reason was a, a little bit sinister. Time to inflict damage on the current case before court, that of Dieter Haag seeking assisted death. Yeah, I, I don't think for one moment my lenient sentence is related to the government going soft. I think it was related to the number of other people who might have been implicated in it, including Desmond Tutu, who was very supportive. Maybe they wanted to keep the whole thing under wraps, keep it out of the media as long as possible. Archbishop Desmond Tutu publicly supported your cause and your book details some of the communication you had with him. Uh, tell us what his support meant to you. And without going into too much detail, how did you feel knowing you could have potentially pulled him into a murder charge? Bishop Desmond Tutu support was crucial. In New Zealand, um, he wrote to the court and arranged for me to be allowed to come back to South Africa on bail. And when I was sentenced, he pleaded with the court to give me a lenient sentence. And the judge confirmed that his letter influenced her sentencing in New Zealand. And again here, when I was arrested for murder, it was a huge shock. But the next day, the next day he came out in support of me. And immediately people realised, hey, this is not murder. Why is Archbishop Tutu supporting Davison? Yeah, yeah he, he made a huge, huge difference. I'm extremely grateful. I certainly would never have wanted him to be involved in a court case. Though knowing Desmond Tutu as I did, he would not have walked away from it. He believed in what he believed in and he spoke loudly about it. He believed in assisted dying and he believed the law should be changed. And if he was forced to go to court, he would have gone there quite proudly and not been ashamed of defending the right of Anwick Berger, Justin Berrien and Richard Holland to have an assisted death. Now, in your recent book, you write about being horrified to think that people were using your previous book as a sort of how-to guide for assisted dying. And there was a story about Mrs. Smith that brought about this realization. And do you want to remind people that this is not what your book was intended for? Yeah. My mother was a medical doctor and she had terminal cancer and she decided to go on a hunger strike to end your life. And if you stop eating, there's only one possible outcome, you die. And being a medical doctor, I trusted her judgment when she went on a hunger strike, that she was doing the right thing. She was 85 years old, and we assumed she'd die quite quickly. But in fact, it's a terrible way to die. Your body essentially decomposes to keep your vital organs alive. And by five weeks of a hunger strike, she couldn't move any limb of her body and was essentially rotting in her own bed and incapable of ending her own life by any other means. And at that point, was forced to ask for help. So a hunger strike is not the way to do it. Um, my mother was 85, and at that time, she'd never used a computer or used Google. Um, so she used her medical knowledge, not what she would have found on Google, which would have said, don't go on a hunger strike. It's not the way to end your life. Rather change the law. Now, I also read about your encounter with your GP, and you wrote that you believe that the medical profession is to blame for a lack of change in the legal provisions governing euthanasia. Tell us why you believe that. The doctors are on the cutting edge of life and death every day. They see people suffering at the end of life, and they hear the pleas for mercy to end their life. They know what's happening, and if they spoke up, in one voice and said, change the law, I believe it would happen very, very quickly. But they aligned or sworn allegiance to the Hippocratic Oath. They can't end a life. In fact, the alternative, they must keep lives alive as long as possible. Um, I believe the Hippocratic Oath should be updated as written 500 BC and be more in line with the modern medical treatments that keep people alive way beyond the normal life span. 
I find it disappointing that doctors don't speak up in favour of a law change. It would make a huge difference. Lastly, Professor Davison, you found a Dignity Essay, a pro-euthanasia organisation. Tell us about your organisation and the role it's playing to get euthanasia laws changed in South Africa. We initially went about changing the law by going through Parliament, but that was not going to succeed in this country. And we're now taking the alternative route through the Constitutional Court. Um, If the Constitutional Court approves an assisted death, then the court and the parliament are on different pages and parliament will have to change the law. We now have a case before the court, that of Dieter Haack. He has motor neuron disease and he's requesting a doctor-assisted death or the option of it, a doctor-assisted death. He's already given his evidence earlier in the year. Now the, the prosecution will present their evidence or the government And if he loses that case, we will take it to the Constitutional Court. And we believe we have one of the most liberal constitutions in the world, and dignity in life is a theme of that constitution. We believe dignity in dying is part of life, and that the constitution will uh, rule in favour of Dieter Haag having an assisted death, and that will lead to a law change. That was Professor Sean Davison unpacking his book, The Price of Mercy, a fight for the right to die with dignity.